Okay, so here's my clue to record. We are recording now, and we are off and running. Uh, that's me. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on who I am because we got other stuff to cover. So I'm a BPI guy, uh, I'm a former ResNet guy, um, code counsel kind of stuff. So, so today we've got uh, some fundamentals on uh, air leakage, uh, locating the leaks, some uh, different diagnostic tools. Many of you may be familiar with them, but we're going to go through those. Uh, some are new. Whenever I go to other trainings, I'm always uh, interested to see what other people have come up with, and I try to share some of that stuff with you today and whether or not you're going to smoke it. Um, I did not mention this in the last one, but I've been reminded that I should remind people that uh, our cloud is out. Um, this is something that is a um, going to change the way you test. Uh, it's a simple application that uh, does stuff automatic for you. Slides may not go quick enough for me, but you basically open up uh, our cloud, connect to your gauge. You only need Wi-Fi on the gauge to work because most of your devices all have Wi-Fi. Run a test automatically, uh, share the report, and also saves the report for you. So uh, it's a phenomenal uh, resource. Even if you don't have um, uh, data, you always have GPS, and it'll always work and save your information, and you can uh, upload it later. And it gives you these great reports that you can use, and just make sure you have good documentation as to what you're doing to pass, um, and uh, or share this for a compliance report. All right, this was supposed to come up later, but you know, here's what it is, a slide, thought I moved it. We're going to do some basic math real quick, um, get your pens and paper, paper out. Um, and a calculator. Nobody owns a calculator anymore. Everybody chooses their phone. So uh, the reason that we are is because when you do some blower door stuff, you want to find out how leaky one is to the other. Um, and what are your comparisons? So um, square footage is for duct testing in general. There is a surface area concept that's starting to make more headway that it's not just the volume that you're actually going to compare your numbers to, but it's actually the all six sides of the surface area. Okay, so we, we have volume or we have uh, all uh, six sides of the surface area as a method to do that. Uh, I do give a quick overview about where are you measuring. So your uh, a standard that's common out there is an ANSI uh, Z765-2012 or whatever version may be out there now. Um, but in general, it's outside to outside because that's including the thermal um, uh, envelope that you're trying to measure. And that thermal envelope usually goes to the outside and is touching that part. So um, there is an exception that there's a five-foot rule in that ANSI standard, which we just include anywhere where, um, uh, as I described, carpet can go. That's actually what we're going to include. Um, but we're going to do a quick calculation here. So we take a, uh, an area, we take a volume. Uh, all this information comes directly from the gauge. And here's how you calculate air changes per hour. Again, it's one of those things if you're going to do fine leaks. Usually you want to know how leaky the house is. This is a fundamental measurement that actually we all use to compare. So on this test for 33,000 cubic feet, I got 1,900 CFM. Uh, you multiply that from minutes to hours by 60 divided by your volume, and here I've got 3.45 air changes per hour. And you can also get that live in the gauge, so that is kind of a secondary um, uh, thing that happens here, why the smart gauge is so uh, valuable that I can instantly do it. I don't need to pull out my phone to do the calculations. Uh, here's a com uh, ex explanation more detailed on that. So some of these slides I'm going to kind of move through kind of quickly because I thought they were becoming later and they would just be fillers. So, But here's one that is really um, interesting, and that is that Usually you, your homeowner, your builder wants to know, how big is the leak? Joe, you're here. You're testing. You know, we, uh, we're we not passing or uh, uh, homeowners want to know, well, how big is the leak? So here's an, actually an ability to uh, to do that is to um, uh, calculate that. And you can also do this in the gauge. The, ga the smart gauge will also give you this based upon this type of calculation. So I can get this. Uh, it's, it's called EQLA, equivalent leakage area. I can get this in square inches or square feet. And then you do a, a square root of that to find out what times what uh, gives you that number. And then you can describe to people just how big um, their uh, opening is. So clearly I have less than one square foot here. So uh, it's easy to kind of give somebody an idea about what that is. Something that no that number can grow to look like a window. And that's really um, uh, eye opening uh, or window opening for your clients. And they see just how big this uh, opening is. All right, here's some basic air sealing stuff. I lost some of these slides, but we'll see what we got here. So uh, for the first time, you know the conditions of the envelope if you're doing code or you know that the home has already been built under a code. So uh, basically, once the the state or the jurisdiction goes to a code, um, it may or may not have a blower door test. We're assuming that it did. But from now on, we now know it's no longer out of control. It could be anything, too. It's usually one of these kind of numbers. So it's three air changes uh, to around seven air changes per hour. But prior to this home being under a code compliance, it could have been easily been 20 air changes per hour. 
mean, if you've done any existing homes that are older homes, you know those numbers can go pretty high and leakage can exceed almost your blower door options. So here's some uh, pretty raw examples um, in the uh, of stuff we you see all the time. So I mean, this this large one here is just a classic example. So um, question to the you the viewers out there, I'll try and engage you as much as possible. So when we do have air leakage, all right, uh, this is not actually just uh, um, uh, an exchange of temperatures. This is not actually a, a hot moving to cold. But whenever you do have um, uh, air leakage, like you see in the bottom uh, right, is a, a great example. I've got this hole. All right. So with that hole moves air. What moves with the air? All right. So what are some things to go along that? So uh, one example would be the hot air is almost always moving with that. So uh, cold doesn't move. Uh, it's always the hot that moves. So if it's um, we're going to use it, we're all it's summertime right now uh, when this is being uh, broadcasted. So uh, here's going to be the hot air is clearly moving into the colder uh, envelope. And moving down through that so it actually is moving downward the hot air is moving down through the attic into these uh, cavities so um, the other thing is moisture it's also carrying a lot of moisture with you so um, the issue is that when air is moving through uh, the envelope or this kind of leakage um, it br brings things that deteriorate the envelope as well as things that make clients incredibly uncomfortable this is uh, Larry Zarker. If you know Larry, he's the uh, CEO of um, uh, BPI. I made this prop for him talking about why infiltration is so valuable, and it's basically just a wall section showing you what could be in your wall uh, besides just insulation that um, has air moving through it, but you could have uh, any kind of rodents or all kinds of other issues that are causing problems. And uh, I connected the two between if you don't know where your air is coming from, because it's never fresh. You can use the word fresh air, but it's usually not. So uh, this is where the air comes through your wall, and if you don't think that you're actually breathing that, then you're just kind of don't understand building science or understand how the building is assembled. So um, I, I tell people uh, regularly, well, you know, are you uh, do you feel comfortable to put your mouth over that receptacle and breathe? And they're all like, no, I would never do that. Like, well, you're doing that all the time. That's where the air comes from that you actually do breathe in your house. So this is really a hammer at home kind of a concept and uh, illustration. Okay, so looking for some feedback again. I, I do try and do uh, things that come up with some concepts. So uh, these are some options that I have from um, floors, walls, ceilings, uh, ducts, fireplaces. If you want to reach out quickly and say, which of these things do you think is the 31%? Which do you think may be the 15, 14, 13, the, the, the secondary moderate issues You know, on this list? This is an old list. I know that this list needs some updating, but this is the same list that most of us uh, Google and use regularly. So. Okay, so um, anybody anybody want to comment on what they think is the number one issue here? So um, they are a few flooding in here. So um, clearly they kind of went in order that they are actually um, floors went uh, first, ducts they actually go around the the, the circle there. So the, clearly the most surface area we have is the most where we have most leakage. Uh, ducts is number two. Uh, the fireplaces uh, and plumbings all just kind of work around. Notice that the electrical outlet is the smallest uh, on there, and that's because literally the outlets themselves don't leak much. It's actually what happens on the other side of the outlet and uh, what happens inside the walls. So um, this is a slide that I tried to do animation showing where the air barrier was. The, the pink area is the thermal boundary. The air barrier is aligned with the thermal boundary, and then we go and we cut holes in it. Um, and now the air barrier has been adjusted or moved. Now I've got openings that go to the uh, attic, crawl space, uh, air handler. Anything that actually now is penetrating that blue line becomes the air barrier. So the reality is, is that your duct system, your can lights, your junction box, anything else that you, you have is now the air barrier. Uh, on th uh, Tuesday, we kind of focus on duct diagnostics, and we kind of mentioned some of this, but now we're really focused on that all of these things are actually now part of the air barrier and actually part of your direct leakage. Uh, this is a slide that comes from uh, uh, Building Science Corporation. Uh, you may have seen it, uh, but it's talking about on the uh, left side here is vapor diffusion, how much um, – Literally, the moisture that moves, not air, but the moisture, it's a permeability issue. So um, it goes through the drywall itself. In general, drywalls, anything that's solid is considered to be an air barrier. Um, there are some of the things that are air retarders, but in general, it's either a barrier or uh, most things are actually a uh, – some things could be a retarder. But most things, if it stops the air, it's an air barrier. But they still have permeability. They still have the ability for moisture to move through these. All right. So on the left, we've got, again, uh, a piece of drywall, a great uh, – 
conditions here, 75 degrees, 50% relative humidity. And the difference between the drywall on the left and drywall on the right is on the right, they just cut a one inch square opening. And now this is the amount of moisture that moves through in one week in a hot, humid climate. This is uh, almost two gallons of water each week through one square inch. And if you imagine that many of these older homes could have two or three square feet of an opening, that's a lot of moisture moving through that, deteriorating the, 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 the building itself and causing a lot of, especially hot, humid climate, a lot of moisture that's causing some serious issues in, uh, in terms of comfort in the house. Uh, here I jumped over to a northern climate. So northern climates, you're not prone to not have moisture issues. So um, now we're dealing with um, uh, 30 quarts of water, um, 7.5 gallons. This is a heating season. So this is over multiple months, the amount of moisture. So it's still a lot, um, but uh, not like the hot and humid climates. But again, the moisture here has two issues in northern climates. And that is that it not only causes comfort issues, but it also significantly can uh, freeze and thaw in the spring and deteriorate the structure. So some people have uh, moisture damage that shows up by summertime because the uh, everything is frozen, thawed, and now it's showing up as moisture, mold, or other issues inside the house. All right, so we take our average home. We uh, cut a bunch of holes in it. Ultimately, we make Swiss cheese out of it. And uh, my uh, focus was that it isn't always just what happens um, – uh, on the outside is also what happens in between the two uh, uh, floors uh, is really one of the issues. The number one place, the two number one places are really kind of connected. You should always focus on air slay, and that is the attic and chases. Usually the chases are connected to the attic, so that's really uh, a priority. So one of the things you uh, I, I've been promoting for years, South Face made these uh, illustrations. Again, these are air leakage issues and where they come from. So um, the list on the right side is a code compliance checklist. But in general, these are great uh, places, especially if you do have these things open for remodelers. This is a great uh, resource for that. And um, you know they're, they're, we call this the six pack hole. It really should be called the twenty four pack hole because the plumbers cut an opening large enough to move a case of beer through there. Um, and other things that are indirectly uh, air sealing is actually now insulation is in the uh, knee walls. This is uh, required to be on all six sides. It is an air barrier, and it does actually help seal up the wall. You can actually seal it up in addition. Uh, so the inside seal, the outside, now the insulation is no longer prone to having more air get directly up into that. Uh, here's a great example of a tub that's on a second floor that's actually connected to the eaves, um, and it should have had an air barrier behind it. Um, now that's actually a requirement. So again, Homes are be able to perform much better. The question is, how well will they be ventilated? What kind of air quality issues will we have now that the homes are getting tighter? Uh, on the upper left is an example of a chase that's exposed to the attic. Um, this is this is still a common thing I still see in newer construction and stuff that's not uh, homes that are not that old. That that hot air from the attic is moving directly down around those ducts and uh, showing up and coming through any kind of openings they can uh, on the bottom of that uh, drywall uh, near the floor. Uh, here's the links. Um, I will uh, just respond to somebody's uh, um, question, so I'll reply all. And uh, these are actually the, um, the links to download these. So if you look at your question panel, you can see uh, there's a reply, and uh, hopefully both of them will be there. If not, let us know. I can make sure these get sent to you as a PDF. So um, this also, the bottom one includes the how to do some of the sealing and some of the uh, corrections that's mentioned in the air sealing uh, illustrations. Uh, another one that's out there, this is um, comes from uh, uh, Advanced Energy and uh, SIA as an organization. These are also tips on how to uh, uh, to do um, some of the conditions we saw, very similar illustrations uh, in terms of how to actually correct some of the, the problems. Uh, you know can lights are a major issue. They can have, uh, I'm estimating around two square inches. That's a lot for each can light. Um, and you can see on the picture on the right, the amount of, um, uh, that the fiberglass is working as a filter uh, to keep uh, a lot of that uh, uh, conditions in the attic from moving directly through the, uh, the can light itself. So we're at, at least you're getting filtered air uh, into your interior. There are a couple of things that are impacting you. Um, uh, the summer can be depending on uh, how cool you keep your house, but in northern climates, this is a significant issue that the stack effect, uh, lower uh, leaks versus uh, upper leaks 
um, can actually bring in an enormous amount of infiltration because they're able to have a, a pressure source similar to a chimney. The picture on the bottom right is actually um, a reverse that you can see on the left. It's the extreme cold differences and on the right extreme kind of hot differences. So there actually is a reverse stack effect that happens in southern climates where the hot air is actually being pushed in and pulled down and you have leaks on the bottom and they actually will reverse and uh, push themselves out on the opposite. Um, these are some common things I still see in new construction and you, it's shocking, specifically the picture on the right where you've actually got, you know, a whole bunch of studs all together. Not only do I have thermal bridging, but that's actually uh, a white uh, sliver is not a caulk that's actually being able to see directly to outside. So this section of the house didn't need um, OSB. It just has a house wrap and then lap siding. So uh, here we're actually leaking directly to the outside. Here is a, uh, a concept that I try to get across to people that think about HVAC systems. Maybe you're an HVAC contractor, and that is that what's the largest duct system in the house? Uh, anybody want to guess? If you've seen me um, talk, then you know what the answer was. But in general, um, I try to stress that the envelope is the largest duct system in the house. It is the one thing that contains all of our heating and cooling. Thus, when it leaks, it actually impacts our heating and cooling system. So um, how tight will a house be or how tight can it be? Anybody want to give me an idea about how low they've tested or how low they feel the house can be? Uh, I personally feel the house should be as tight as possible as long as there's uh, it's well ventilated and you actually uh, eliminate any of your combustion appliances anywhere near the pressure zones that you actually have here. So um, in the north, they actually will use these skin-tight wraps uh, to wrap the majority of their houses sometimes, and they actually become a submarine. So uh, achieving numbers that are below one air changes per hour in uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin and other places are not that difficult. Um, builders up there describe they want to build a submarine, and there's no reason to give up BTUs. BTUs are uh, heat loss and uh, air leakage. So the tighter the house is, as you saw, the less air is moving through and taking with it moisture and other stuff. Here's an example of anybody uses does manual J. Here's here's actually how this stuff gets calculated, right? So uh, we, I did a case study with um, Jeremy Bagley in Cincinnati, and we I use this as a great example. So it's an older house. This is the, at the bottom, and uh, there you can see how leaky it was. This blower door has uh, almost 6,500 CFM of leakage. That's that's a pretty leaky house. I think it was probably around 3,500 square feet. So uh, it's not a, it's a large house, but nothing excessive. So at the top, we do the estimations about what type of furnace they want to replace or a cooling unit. And the software tells me it should be around 60,000. And once we use the actual real blower door numbers, it should be 84,000. And you can see on the right in the square the differences between the software's estimate and the actual numbers from the blower door. So this software um, can actually use your blower door numbers to determine what type of unit should be in. It also takes in other counts as to windows, doors, other assemblies in the house. But in general, um, the infiltration on this house was so significant that it was 47% of the amount of heating load that they needed. And it was almost 20% of their cooling load. So infiltration is a major uh, significant issue uh, in a house and why well, we should be correcting that. I'm going to skip over this. It's more like if you're going to do a new construction. These are some of the numbers you might estimate as to how leaky it would be, not knowing where it would be in the end. So if you're doing a uh, house, I was doing this in Florida recently. So uh, if, pick your code that you're complying with, and now you would be able to give an estimate of where the manual J calculations actually would land. How about some diagnostic tools? I think that's why some people came here, so let's dig into that stuff. So this should have been earlier than most of the stuff we just looked at. So one of which is a some container that actually is able to measure pressures with your gauge. Again, all this stuff is going to be using the blower door. The blower door is the fundamental cause. Uh, down below, these are not uh, medical devices. These are actually small little brass or um, copper uh, tubing that you could use um, to do your diagnostics, or even I think some of them are even uh, uh, aluminum. So many of you are familiar with a pressure pan. So I thought that I would also explain to you that you can make your own, right? So here's one that I made. So when I go around to do diagnostics in a house, I made something that was big enough to go over a double switch plate. It also will go over a uh, thermostat um, because all the of all the things that have leakage, the thermostat is one of the worst. Usually there's an entire one inch hole for a, a very small um, wire uh, sets that go behind that. 
and uh, that always goes directly to the attic or crawl space depending on where your air handler is. So to me, I wanted to make sure I was able to use something that was uh, always deep enough, simple enough that I could just start going around and doing quick diagnostics. So um, here you can see what I just kind of made my own. And for those of you that want to ask how big is it, um, it is a 10 cup or 2.3 liter uh, container. So I have the feeling you could probably find this at Amazon or on uh, Walmart or Target or something. So it's a very, it's a little, it's a larger than average um, container for sandwiches. There, uh, Frank asked, was there a webinar on how to make that? There may have been. We've done webinars on um, uh, other types of tools, but um, in general, it's a, uh, a series of weather stripping that just goes around the edge. It's hard to get those things to stick. You may actually have to use super glue to hold those in place uh, on the inside and outside, um, but this did work pretty well for me. The other is the series of uh, brass uh, uh, aluminum variety tubes. You can go to um, like Hobby Lobby or some of these places that sell um, um, craft stores, craft supplies. Uh, you can also go to plumbing supplies and uh, get some of this stuff. So in the middle um, picture on the bottom, it shows different size tubings and different tubings I've got. So I've got stuff that's um, uh, probably a sixteenth of an inch, uh, eighth of an inch, some uh, uh, number between those two. But in general, they usually fit inside the tubing uh, one way or the other. So. Uh, in general, you can find these pretty well, and the, cha the challenge is, is actually bending them. You need, need to bend them over a round surface. If you just bend them with your hands, you will crimp them, and it will be compromised. But uh, the tools on the bottom right are things that I would use to get up into an attic when I wanted to do um, some of the other tests we're going to talk about is people are like, well, how do you get your uh, tube up in the attic without it getting pinched by the, uh, the hatch? Uh, whether it's wood or drywall. So usually those hatches have a little bit of wiggle room. So I use a um, these uh, brass uh, 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 little tubing, and I'm able to actually get it up over and around the uh, uh, the insulation uh, that could be blocking it and uh, the hatch itself, and uh, able to get the test. So also I use these for um, uh, other things that you can do, like for uh, plumbing. So um, if you're looking to find out if the, this plumbing wall is connected outside, we're going to go through this diagnostic as an option, but I can just easily put this probe uh, in behind any kind of opening or uh, crack I have in plumbing. Uh, be very careful. In fact, I'll make sure it's, it's uh, stated. Uh, do not put a metal probe where you have electricity. I know that seems like duh, but some people still want to do that. They'll take off a cover and they'll try and find out how leaky it is. Don't, of course, never put it into the outlet. Uh, so I usually tell people try and find a um, something that's uh, low voltage. Um, your uh, AV system, speaker uh, connection, something that has a different plate, uh, cable box. Take that off and then actually see what's inside the wall. And we're going to talk about here uh, how to actually do diagnostics for that. I do have a few slides on IR. It's another tool that you can use. It, to me, it's uh, an expensive tool, so I don't spend a lot of time on it, but it can be very valuable to, to do that. So the picture on the right is my uh, house I had in Arizona, and this is connected to a knee wall in the attic, and you can see where um, the drywall is not really secured around that area, oh, and there's just insulation here. So what I actually have is air moving through the insulation and starting to come down into the wall. Um, so in order to do this, if you're going to use this for diagnostics, I highly recommend you at least get a level one uh, uh, certification. Uh, if you're going to do it for yourself or not ever, never use it for a report, that's your choice. But if you are going to use it for a report, the last thing you want to do is increase your liability by trying to determine something that could be water damage, could be air infiltration, maybe missing insulation, and uh, that's why you should be certified to make those kind of uh, assessments. Here's some other examples of uh, th those, this kind of uh, conditions. The difference between air leakage uh, here and here, you can see where uh, air is actually now streaming down around the insulation. Uh, it looks kind of like fuzzy. Those are signs that you actually have infiltration uh, versus just a gap or a big chunk of uh, uh, change of color that use indication that you have a uh, lack of insulation. Um, okay, so here's another uh, new slide. I just try to you know come up with some new stuff for everybody this week. So uh, ducts are open. We're doing the blower door test. Another method of doing um, a diagnostic. I didn't know where to fit this in, so I just threw it in here. So I'm going to do my um, uh, blower door test, and my total leakage is 950 CFM. It's a nice simple number. That should be considered kind of probably a 
fairly tight home. Those are good numbers to have in general. So all of the doors, remember we, when we set up the house, we're uh, informed that everything outside is closed, everything inside is opened up. So all the interior doors, I open up anything, including anything that has to do with a speaker system. Uh, I usually open up the cabinet below the sinks, anywhere that's got plumbing, I open up those kind of doors just to make sure that I'm able to read or find that kind of air leakage because usually you can go around with your hand and, and feel this. So if you're trying to do diagnostics um, in terms of uh, uh, chunky areas, like, oh, is this one room or is this part of the house, if you can separate it, an issue. So when I have my blower door going, I, um, I can actually do another option to be like, well, let's close off one, this one bedroom, right? Um, the image at the top is an accident. So um, so here, when I closed off this master bedroom door, I went down to 875. So the difference was um, 950. So I went down 75 CFM. Now I know that I have, in theory, well, actually 75 CFM of leakage behind that door. You still, uh, I usually try to do something at the bottom to make sure that that kind of gets sealed as best it can. The door is not airtight, but in general, just by closing the door, I've been able to isolate what kind of leakage I have here. So I can actually go around and do each one of the doors uh, independently or even together to find out which one is, is uh the greatest CFM reduction and know, to, know that there's something in this room that I now need to do additional diagnostics on to try and find that as an issue. Okay, the pressure pan. We're not going to be doing what we normally do with the pressure pan, but we have similar images. So it's the same concept. The blower door is on. We've created a pressure differential of 50 pascals, right? So wherever I have uh, 50 pascals um, leaving the house through the blower door, there must be 50 pascals coming in. It's my goal to go find these leakage in this Pascal uh, difference. So here's some images I use for um, uh, the duct leakage. So remember that duct leakage, again, it is the, um, the air barrier. Once it penetrates the drywall, that anything from this return that goes up and over or this supply that goes up and over, it is now the air barrier. So these little pink uh, blobs are actually air leakage. And um, we got the blower door on, and there's leakage around the boots. I didn't really dwell on that, but it is definitely some like significant leakage. It's number one thing that people go to a house and check for. Uh, and there's leakage in the ducts themselves. I actually have air that leaks through the ducts and air that leaks around where they touch the drywall or should touch the drywall. So these are the pressures that I have. These same pressures show up in a variety of options throughout the house. So my uh, amazing RetroTech technician can go around and use the pressure pan and go measure these uh, in general. So you've seen this before. This is very uh, common, to how you use the pressure pan to do ducts. Um, my threshold is two, uh, three maybe, but out over three, then I realize there's significant uh, leakage that need, must be addressed. Somebody should go up there and, and correct that. So uh, if you have a different threshold, let me know what you guys use as your pressure pan threshold. The difference is um, actually now I can take that same pressure pan or even just a probe that we talked about those brass probes or even just the tube itself. The tube will fit in. It can be done the same way. So now I'm actually able to put the um, pressure pan over a can light. Um, I can put it over any kind of junction box, anywhere where I can put this pressure pan over it. The difference is, is that the pressure pan for the ducts is usually such kind of small leakage, but it's significant that those numbers are much lower. So a pressure pan for a duct system is around two or three pascals. Here, um, you're, you're going to find stuff that's going to be closer to uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s sometimes. So keep track that if it's 50, then it's outside. One of the things that people get hung up on is if it's positive or negative. It depends on where you connect the tube. We uh, uh, Both manufacturers, if you do diagnostics for this kind of stuff, we say put it on the input on channel A. And, uh, and you're good. If for some reason you put it on the reference, then this number becomes negative. It's still a number. The higher I am to 50, you're outside. So it's not a positive or negative. It's just the higher the number. So in general, my philosophy is, and others, it's I'll give you five CFM. So if I have measured something that's around five or less, that's usually not considered to be an issue. It's like, well, there's some leakage. You know, is it worth going up to try and find that little, that small leakage? Uh, here, it would be. I would be trying to say, wow, that, that these cans are significant leakage. They need to be gone up and sealed or replaced one or the other. So anywhere where I find 50, from now on, 50 is going to be our major number. So here we're actually doing a uh, receptacle, and I'm still getting numbers around 43. So it's connected to the outside somewhere. 
right? So if I didn't use the pressure pan, I could even, again, just use the tube itself to try and uh, test these kind of numbers. That could be below uh, a sink um, and uh, determine that over by the, the drain that I actually have uh, similar kind of numbers. Uh, if it's um, what really gets challenging is when that number is no longer clearly near 50, but kind of near uh, 15 or 20, that you have significant leakage um, and uh, it's still worth going to get. But it's it's a smaller leak. These leaks are proportionate uh, to the amount of air that it has access to. So uh, what that means is how how ventilated is the attic uh, is what limits the amount of air that it has access to. So if this one if this leak on this can light is um, smaller and this one's larger, that number will be proportionate on your pressures that you're reading. Uh, so there's some other applications on the pressure pan test. Um, so there is a, a uh, so what we have here, I'll use the image on the right because it shouldn't have animated. So the image on the right is actually we're checking a can light. Uh, it could be a register, but it's actually a can light. So we did air sealing in my attic, and then we want to find out if we were successful. So um, this pole that I've got, I think it goes up to like 16 feet or something. Um, it, it's used for um, at Christmas time to hang uh, hang lights around your uh, gutters. So if you see that, it's got a green handle and a long red pole. I think it uh, articulates uh, five or six times. Definitely worth getting. Lightweight, um, very helpful for a variety of stuff we do for diagnostics. Right, so let's find the air barrier. This is one of the things that people uh, do for diagnostics. Um, one of the most common places where you can see that my orange is actually the thermal boundary, all right? Blue would be a variety of air barrier, which means um, drywall. But let's just say the, the dining room here, I've got a various areas where I could have uh, framing or drywall that may not be actually touching my thermal boundary. Uh, the most common place you see this is around fireplaces, that they'll actually do some framing around the fireplace to bring this bookshelf out or do something out here or just give you a, a solid wall. Meanwhile, my thermal boundary is out here in the perimeter, leaving a huge gap that allows uh, conduction and other issues to make your insulation ineffective or, and uh, other challenges. So if you want to find out where your air barrier is, uh, here's some basic methods that we can actually use. So let's zoom in on this little family room section here with the uh, fireplace. So what I'm going to start with is, again, the blower door is happening. i got the blower door running. I create a pressure differential so I can do diagnostics. And right now, we now know that the blue line is my pressure boundary or my air barrier. Right? So I put my um, uh, probe through uh, some little small space. Uh, you should never do destructive testing without the um, – uh, written approval from your client, uh, but sometimes you can find little things that allow you to put these probes in without doing anything destructive. So uh, it want to make sure it's clear that some people take the reference or the second part of the channel and run it outside. I, I don't do that. Um, I'm usually just referencing what's on the inside. It's thoroughly enough for me to do my diagnostics. So if you do take uh, the reference tube outside, to me, it's just kind of a cumbersome thing to drag around as you do this. So so for here, I did this test, and I'm like, wow, I put it on the other side of the drywall, and it's 50. It is outside, which means that there's air leakage, there's infiltration, there's all kinds of other issues here. So this is outside. This is my um, uh, air barrier, thermal boundary. Um, now my air, my insulation is totally ineffective. Uh, I do it again and find out that it's zero, which means that they added an air barrier. This is what new construction should look like, is there should be an air barrier directly where the insulation is. So if there's an air barrier where the insulation is, I can now put my probe behind the drywall, which is, really is no longer uh, the, the main air barrier. The main air barrier is back here with the uh, thermal boundary. So I can say, oh, it's zero, then this is uh, – uh, on the inside, then my air barrier still has not been penetrated, so my this uh, drywall that's right here is not um, the air barrier. It's just a piece of drywall. Okay, how about some uh, zonal pressure diagnostics? So before I do some of the stuff I just did is um, the individual locations, uh, it's easy to kind of do this as a uh, a quick and dirty uh, let's just find out where my major leaks are. So here's Jay West um, using a gauge um, and uh, puts a probe underneath the uh, garage door. Uh, blower door is on, and he's trying to find out how uh, attached the garage is to the interior based on the pressure differences between these two. Okay, so for zonal pressure diagnostics, we're going to uh, make sure we keep track of two things. The blower door is on, and it's creating a 50 pascal difference. We're depressurizing just to make sure we're on the same page. Uh, you could do it pressurizing. It still is just a pressure differential. That 
um, whenever I would do these tests, sometimes I would kind of get lost. I was like, ah, what's the number? Is it positive or negative? And I learned that positive or negative doesn't matter. The closer I am to 50 does. So I just take all my tubes off. I just disconnect everything. Whatever I've got on there, disconnect it. Gauge goes to zero. Clearly, I now am measuring the inside. Zero is inside. So to me, that was always a way to confirm whatever you're doing um, uh, scenario. So you can actually use the speed control on the fan to bring it up to 50, separate your gauge, and uh, not use your gauge to control this, and now walk around with just the same gauge you use to do your blower door test. Some people will drag around a tube that goes outside just so they can confirm if they are at a 50 pascal difference. Right. So uh, my goal is to find out how connected the attic is or the crawl space or the garage uh, to the interior. So the first thing I'll do is we're going to get the um, – uh, the attic is uh, unconditioned. It's to outdoors. Uh, it's connected outside. It's well ventilated to make sure we're all on the same page. And I've got the numbers of 20, uh, but it should be 50. So I now know through these red kind of uh, indicators that I have significant leakage either through the ducts, through can lights, through something that that's where I should make a major effort to find these leaks and seal them. So then I would get my pressure pan out and go do the diagnostics and try and isolate where some of these things are. This entire wall is connected um, or all the can lights. None of them are sealed. It gives me an idea about what it is. Same with the crawl space. If I get numbers in the crawl space, it's, it's, uh, crawl space is vented. It uh, should be going to outside. Then I actually could say, okay, uh, now I need to find these connections. And sometimes these are m a little more difficult because it's not – uh, things that are penetrating the attic the way um, things do the crawl space. So you may find that it's the perimeter. It may be a drain. Uh, it may just be cracks in the um, – uh, if, if it has uh, – sorry, I was thinking of a slab. Um, or there's a variety of uh, openings from the framing issues, uh, ducts, whatever it is. There's a connection between that crawl space and the wood framing that's there. It could just be a uh, – um, uh, the type of flooring that they're using uh, allows leakage to move through. So if I got 50, I'm like, wow, this is great. The crawl space does not have any leakage, and I can move on to focus on the attic uh, being the issue. So when I combine slide, slide decks, um, we're now going to repeat. I don't want to repeat anything. Any other questions? Anybody out there? Questions? Anything? Uh, nope. Looks like we're good. <laughs> not a lo low discussion day. Okay, so um, let's go to uh, smoke and using smoke to do diagnostics in, in relation to the blower door. So blow one, all, all things we've been talking about, blower door has been on. That's how you find your leaks. So there are ways to use uh, smoke or um, additional diagnostics to try and find some of these concerns. So uh, one that's been out there forever, many people own these things, is titanium tetrachloride. Uh, comes in this red, looks like a stick of dynamite. Um, but if you're going to do diagnostics where you have occupants, which means you're on the inside of the house, um, then uh, we highly recommend that you not use this. Oops, the duct tester is supposed to be gone. That This is something that's just highly corrosive. So my goal was you go to this step. There are um, uh, SDS sheets about the, ha the hazardous conditions, but um, I personally am more on the healthy environment, healthy diagnostics, that this is not a great thing to be using for um, diagnostics inside the house. And the one reason why this is a great diagnostic uh, device is because it's neutral buoyant, that it does allow you to do a puff of air and watch what happens, whether it goes up, down, or into the wall, or it gets pushed out of the wall. Uh, it's a great tool. But uh, the chemicals are now just something that's uh, been ra rated or considered to be much higher. So if you're using this, I highly uh, encourage you not to use it where you have an uh, occupied house, where the occupants are. Uh, it still works great for uh, potentially a crawl space or um, uh, attic. And remember, if it's uh, hazardous to your occupants, it's hazardous to you as you use this. So, And you're the one <laughs> the closest to it constantly. So be cautious about using uh, titanium tetrachloride. We do have some plan Bs for you. There is a smoke puffer, the dragon uh, puffer. Uh, you've seen this. Um, this one does allow you to tilt this around or do stuff. The smoke is not buoyant, and it comes out uh, sometimes uh, slow and then uh, large. Uh, so it, it, it has its purpose. Um, sometimes you can uh, have areas where your client can't see smoke moving, like uh, under in can lights. So you you really don't want to get your clients on a ladder so they could feel that air, but you can actually reach this up 
uh, do a puff of smoke and watch it move around from the air that's being brought in from a can line. We'll say this is our can box at the bottom. I use it just as a thing to determine where the hole is. So you can't really push air into the blower door uh, exactly. I do have some examples about how to do that. Uh, here's a new product that's out there, the Power Tiny S. Um, it's out there, and um, this is a great um, option for a variety of folks that are um, oops, doing uh, uh, testing with smoke and are looking for something that they can control. Um, can be held upside down, uh, moved around in any way and uh, is a, a great asset. So if you want to learn more about that, then uh, uh, reach out in the background and we'll get that to you. There's a larger uh, power tiny, which we're going to use, talk about how to do an entire home. So it does not work to go around and find uh, individual holes. Uh, it's more designed to do something where I actually could smoke the entire house. Okay. So here's an example that, that I did when I was in uh, Georgia. We uh, took the house and we wanted to find, find out where are the leaks. So we uh, filled the house up with smoke had blower doors to pressurize the house on both sides so we could push the smoke out. So um, uh, it was shocking places where we would have swore were not that leaky. The windows, we found out, were the leakiest thing in this house. And it wasn't around the windows. It was literally through the windows. Um, this perimeter around the entire thing is, has a seam sealer. It's caulked. It's really a, a – this is all high-end construction. Uh, but we were shocked to see how much leakage we had around the perimeter and around some other areas where we were doing this kind of test. So you can see here between the uh, filling the house up with smoke on the bottom and uh, how dense it got, you really couldn't see inside uh, very well, um, but we all were outside looking for uh, the leaks and uh, documented those. Uh, but in general, you must call the fire department before doing this kind of testing because your neighbors will call the fire department and say, uh, you know, afraid that you've caught this house on fire. So we did do that, luckily, and uh, they came by to see what we were doing. They thought it was kind of an interesting concept as to why they got this phone call. But um, in general, it's not something that uh, you want to do without notifying the, uh, the fire department or making sure there's any smoke detectors uh, that are on to get uh, uh, turned off. Because otherwise, that will uh, alert everybody and also could uh, uh, trigger the uh, fire department indirectly, depending on the system. And now they've showed up and you get fined. There's also another tool. Usually, we take this with us all the time. It's hard to leave behind. It's your hand and that uh, your skin can do that. If you're looking for really uh, super low flows uh, that you're not really sure if air is coming out or it's hard to tell, uh, you can um, – uh, gently wet your hand uh, on the back, and uh, it's where you have a lot of uh, sensitivity. And when it's wet, that air movement will do a uh, slight uh, evaporation, and you'll be able to feel it um, much faster than if you just had your hand by itself. Make sure you got your – they used to be called material safety data sheets. Now they're called SDS sheets. And, um, uh, again, even if whenever I go to a home, I uh, make sure that – um, I leave this behind, um, and uh, if you need those, those are on the website with uh, for RetroTech. Um, they're on all of their product pages as uh, additional documentation. Uh, someone asked a question about um, the question about uh, in, uh, air change per hour. When you when must you have mechanical ventilation? Um, so this is the code answer to that, and the code answer is if you are less than five air changes per hour. Um, that's actually straight out of the code itself. Um, most of the country is required to be three air changes per hour, so mechanical ventilation is just required in new construction uh, all the time. Uh, Florida is the only exception. Florida has three air changes uh, or less requires mechanical ventilation. But um, otherwise, you uh, always are going to have mechanical ventilation once you go to the uh, 2012 or 2015 code. And actually, mechanical ventilation is not in the energy code. It's in the IRC. So there's usually a connection or a disconnect, actually, between those two. So real quick, these are the new products. This is the smoke generator, and um, I'll, tr I'll throw something in the, uh, uh, the handouts for that here in just a second. Um, and also there's Power, Power Tiny S. Yes. Um, I've got some for that also that I'll, I'll throw into the, uh, the handouts that are down there. So I'm not sure what we have, but I'll make sure you get, we get that before the end of the day. There's uh, – we are having an issue with that. It only lets you upload two, so uh, you can ah. try, but you may not be able to. Got it. Okay. Um, there's uh, uh, Citrix in motion right there. So here's the Power Tiny S in motion itself. You can see 
um, how small it is in terms of the size of the, his hand, uh, what it does, and it creates a, a nice little, you can do it less or more, so it was designed to give you a powerful ability to do uh, a commercial or residential diagnostics. Um, you can also do, uh, you can get in the attic and you have stuff pulled in, so there's a variety of applications for this. Uh, it's refillable, battery, uh, gets, you are, gets two batteries with the unit itself. And if you're going to do any kind of smoke, you want to make sure you're using a, uh, a remote app uh, to control your um, uh, the device itself. Uh, if you're a smoke generator, uh, definitely want to get – if you're going to smoke a house, you need a – we just plugged it in from outside, but it would help to have some kind of a remote to do this kind of uh, stuff. So I took – I made a SketchUp model of um, a, a common house, and uh, what I wanted to show was uh, infiltration and how that actually impacts the home itself and where that comes from and how, it, how, how can you get hot air from an attic all the way down into a basement. So uh, let's just see what we got here. So here I have the heat that's moving in from the outside, right? Um, and uh, so the difference is that I actually have um, openings literally in the top plates that we've gotten from plumbing penetrations or other uh, electrical um, issues that are happening. So this is one major resource and it easily uh, uh, corrected um, when you're going to go up to the attic to do air sealing. The other is, is when you have uh, gaps at the drywall. So this is something that seems to be less of a, a, a known condition that happens, but uh, the ceiling always goes up first and it gets butted against the, the framing. The framing is never exactly super square or uh, has some type of issues that show up uh, directly on the, uh, uh, the system itself. So if I zoom in, you can see there's always some kind of gap that can happen uh, right along the top plate to where the drywall is. So this gap uh, can, adds up to be not just a significant leakage, but significant infiltration that goes down the walls, uh, shows up in receptacles, or shows up in other plates. So many people will go up and fill these holes, but they actually should have just covered the entire top plate with their um, air sealing. So here's an example of that infiltration on the, on the walls, and uh, you can see it as it shows up here on the inside. So when I take this infiltration that's on the top, we can actually track it all the way down through the walls. It's now inside the wall, so it's able to go into the, uh, the ceiling on the bottom side. So now I'm in the floor, I'm in the ceiling. So now this air that was actually only in the top plate on the uh, uh, in the attic has now actually infiltrated all the way into the floors across my ceiling and now can uh, literally go down the walls from the outside anywhere where this framing has uh, openings and there's a variety of small gaps that uh, allow air to move through. Uh, one thing you can keep track of is you uh, some things may be watertight but that doesn't mean they're airtight that water needs a certain size of an opening to actually move through it. Uh, air does not. Air can actually move through much smaller openings. So there's a variety of other infiltration resources that sources that may come in here between uh, my um, uh, band joists uh, where they actually connect, where plywood ends. Uh, all these are different uh, things. So instead of it coming all the way down from the attic, it could just be coming in from uh, various um, uh, seams that I've got around the uh, the structure itself. These things clearly show up on the inside. So this is why insulation around your rim joist isn't just the solution. It should be uh, insulation uh, around the uh, rim joist or band joist and air seal. So that's a clear indication as to why that becomes an issue. So here you can see where we actually have infiltration coming in from uh, various locations and how they actually impact from uh, uh, all, all the sources together. Uh, they cause comfort issues, moisture issues. Uh, a variety of these kind of problems are definitely uh, uh, in all of our homes. So the goal is to use the tools we've got with the blower door uh, to isolate those and seal them. I, I don't want to go into the, the repair of them. Some of the documents I listed out to you do actually go into some of that as, a, uh, as solutions. Any other feedback? Any other uh, – we're at our, our time limit here. Um, any other – information that I could uh, answer or uh, other things you guys are finding that are successful. Any other tools that you guys are using uh, in connection with the blower door are methods from either, you know, like I talked about closing doors, um, uh, other areas.
one of the things I do, I'm going to go back to another slide here because this is a common um, uh, test that actually uh, isn't occurring, but it should. And it's one way to determine how well your, uh, your client's money was spent when you're doing um, zonal pressure diagnostics. So if I go back to this attic, So if I went back to this attic, and maybe this attic was actually a sealed attic, it was not um, unconditioned. Um, the question would be is, um, you know, I, my thermal boundary is now, an air barrier is at the roof line. They actually did uh, some type of um, high density foam at the roof line, right? So if that's the case, then my number should be uh, closer to less than five or closer to zero. That means that this is considered to be indoors or is um, uh, not outside. So the goal is if my attic is separated from the outdoors, that number should be much lower to less than five. So if it is 20, it means that my attic, which was supposed to be fully sealed, is not. If that number is 50, it means that they actually ventilated the attic and they wasted a lot of money on um, spray foam. Or the worst is they actually created a very tight attic uh, enough that it will hold a lot of moisture and let the moisture in. So when you've got an attic that is um, sealed with foam, uh, it can be a, a dangerous situation in terms of the amount of issues that can happen. So one way to confirm if your uh, attic uh, is sealed off the way it should be is to do a zonal pressure test uh, to find out if they, by accident or intentionally, went ahead and ventilated the attic. All right, that's, uh, that's our wrap for today, um, unless there's any other last-minute uh, questions. Um, I appreciate everybody's time. Uh, please make sure you're uh, able to get the RetroTech webinar, or a newsletter for the webinars. Uh, you can go online and see what webinars we've got, but a great way to keep track of all the things that are happening in RetroTech is to sign up for the newsletter. You can do that online right at the homepage, and uh, we have a newsletter coming out here in probably about a week or so, and it'll list the webinars that we're doing for next month. All right, everybody, have a great day. I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Joe.